Welcome back to So You Really Want to Learn Latin and today we edge ever closer to the end of chapter 9 in So You Really Want to Learn Latin book 3 and we are going to do this by looking at three little topics. Um, we are going to look at impersonal verbs, we're going to look at uh, some little pronouns that we haven't really looked at up until now, uh, a bunch of funny pronouns, um, and then we're just going to finish off by a little thing on indirect speech, which I want to show you. Uh, and that will set us up nicely for uh, next time when we're going to start looking at some raw Latin prose, kind of not, not exactly unadapted, but getting close to being unadapted. Uh, and we're going to be looking at some Caesar. You know, that great scourge of British school pupils uh, back in the 19th century when all they ever did was translate Caesar. Uh, but before we get there, uh, let's have a little look uh, at impersonal verbs. Now, remember, an impersonal verb is a verb that has as its subject the word it. Okay, not a person. They are impersonal. You can't have a, um, a person as the subject of an impersonal verb. And in English, a really good example of that is, it is raining. Okay, it's raining. Who is raining? Well, you couldn't say, he is raining or she is raining. The point is, it is raining. Okay, so that is an impersonal verb. Uh, and there's a whole load of them that we might want to consider in Latin. But in the book, we've got a list of them. They are on page 94. Uh, and we have things like miseret. Now, if I put the word may in front of a lot of these, you'll get the hang of it. So, may miseret literally means it makes me pity. It moves me to pity. It moves me to pity. May miseret. Now, we would probably end up translating that as if it had said, I pity someone. But in Latin, you don't say, I pity you. You say, it moves me to pity. And with the impersonal verbs that we're going to look at uh, in the next few minutes, um, there's always a kind of construction you need to get your head around. Um, and we'll go through them one by one, and I'll show you what I mean. So. For example, with miseret, me miseret means it moves me to pity. Okay, so the person doing the pitying has gone into the accusative case. And then the cause of the pity goes in the genitive, right? So you end up with something like me feminae miseret. Okay, me Feminae miseret literally means it moves me to pity of the woman. Okay, so the cause of the pity is feminae, she's in the genitive, and the person doing the pitying is in the accusative, which was me. So if you want to say I pity the woman in Latin, you say me. Feminae miseret, or me miseret feminae. Okay, now another one would be me pinitet. Now that one means it makes sorry, it makes the person in the accusative sorry. So me pinitet means I'm sorry, it makes me sorry. And the cause of the sorrow, again, goes in the genitive. So you might have uh, me belli pinitet. So, the war causes me sorrow. Or if we're ashamed of something, we say me pudet. Okay, it causes me shame. Me pudet. And again, the cause of that shame would be in the genitive. So, for example, if you, you know, if you were ashamed of your anger, you might say me irai pudet. It causes me shame of the anger. May ere I put it, 
I am ashamed of my anger. Okay, then we've got aportet. Aportet means it is right. Okay, now aportet would be followed by the accusative and the infinitive. So if you wanted to say, um, it is right that the girl should sing, okay, that would be aportet puelam cantare. It is right the girl to sing. It is right for the girl to sing. Okay? Now, there are a whole load of these in the book, uh, so I won't go through every one in turn, uh, but you get the basic idea. Impersonal verbs have as their subject the word it. Uh, they can be put into any tense, by the way. You can say it will be lawful, for example. Now, licket is uh, the impersonal verb for it is lawful. Uh, but you could have lekebit, meaning it will be lawful, or uh, lekebat, it was lawful. But they're always found in the third person singular, because the subject is always it. Okay. Now, a very common one is placket. Okay. So uh, placket, followed by the dative of the person, means it is pleasing to whoever that person is. So if you want to say, you know, that pleases me, it, it, uh, it, it pleases me that, you know, such and such is happening, that would be mihi placket. It is pleasing to me. And finally, in fact, I'll just mention akidit, meaning uh, it happens that. Now, akidit is followed by ut plus the subjunctive. Uh, and if you wanted to say something like it happens that the enemy are attacking, that would be akidit ut hostes opungnent. Or it happens that the soldiers were killed, okidit ut hostes okisi sint. Okay, perfect subjunctive passive. Okay, so that's impersonal verbs. Okay, now if we turn over the page in the great book to page 96. We've got four little pronouns that we just want to have a quick look at. Quis, aliquis, quisque, and quisquam. Quis, aliquis, quisque, and quisquam. Now, the thing about these is you kind of have to get your head around whether these are being used as pronouns or as adjectives. Okay, It's a little distinction that you might want to kind of get your head around. Uh, when you're translating out of Latin, it normally doesn't cause an issue, but sometimes grammatically you do need to be aware of the distinction. Okay, so quis, uh, it's an interrogative pronoun. So who is coming? Quis, when it. Quis, when it. Who is coming? Okay, that's a pronoun. Who, you know, who is coming? But you might want to say, you know, which man is coming? Quis homo. When it. Now there, quis is an adjective agreeing with homo. Um, now, how do these things decline? Well, they're basically like qui qui quad, with just a few little tweaks. Okay, so how does quis go? Well, when it's a pronoun, it goes quis, quis, quid, quem, quam, quid, and then cuis, 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 as if it had been qui qui quad. That's when it is a pronoun. And when it's an adjective, it just goes qui qui quad, quem quam quad. Okay? But, you know, if you know the relative pronoun qui qui quad, you know how this guy goes. Okay, now the second one to look at is quis when it's not an interrogative pronoun, but it is an indefinite pronoun, meaning anyone. You know, anyone can do that. So with this, you might have something like, um, it's often not used after C. If anyone were to come home. Si quis domum redibit. If anyone will return home, then such and such might happen. Okay? Okay. Now, just like the other form of quis, uh, when it is a pronoun, it goes quis quis quid, quem quam quid. And when it's an adjective, it goes qui qua quad, quem quam quad. Okay? Uh, if you're kind of nervous about these, have a look at page 127 at the back of the book. It'll, it'll show you all of this. Okay, third one we've got is aliquis. Now, aliquis means someone. 
And again, the aliquis, that quis bit, is going to decline like the quid quai quad uh, forms that we've seen. So if you wanted to say, perhaps someone will kill the king. Uh, Fortasse aliquis regem interficiet. And finally, quisque, which means each one. Uh, and we've got a great little example of that here. We've got milites domum redierunt cum sua quisque pridar. Lovely word order there. So uh, the soldiers returned home. And then you've got cum sua pridar with his booty. Uh, but quisque, each one with his booty. And last but not least, quisquam is used in, uh, it's used often negative particles or in negative clauses to mean anyone at all. So we've got an example in here, uh, omnes regem timent neque quisquam eum amat. Everyone fears the king, nor does anyone love him. And by that we mean nor does anyone at all. Okay. Okay, so, you know, they are quite refined, these little fellows. You tend to kind of stumble across one in a passage and think, oh, hang on, what's going on there? They all look a bit similar. Um, so you do have to sort of, you know, put the towel around the head and, and pin down which of these forms is being used. So if you've come across them as a bit of vocab that you've learned, Quis who or anyone, uh, quisque, quisque each one, quisquam anyone at all, uh, then knowing that they decline, essentially like qui qui quod, uh, so you get these weird forms like quius dam, okay, um, then you should be okay. I mean, the proof will be in the pudding, and we'll find out if we've nailed all of this when we go on to start tackling some Caesar next time. But finally for today, I just want to say one more thing about indirect statement, and that is that very often an indirect statement construction, the accusative and infinitive, carries on, it can carry on for sentence after sentence after sentence without the need to repeat the kind of verb that introduced it in the first place. Okay, so... You know, you might say, Caesar said that the enemy were coming. Now, that's clearly an indirect statement. But you might then have, full stop, they had been marching for five hours and were now approaching the city. That looks like a normal sentence, but it's still what Caesar was reporting. And therefore, it still goes into indirect speech. Okay, now the best way to, you know, prove that, if you like, is to look at the little example we've got here. So we've got, um, Dixit se Romam ve nisse, amicos laetissimos esse, et inimicos omnes, ex orbe discessisse, quiways in forum con ve nisse, et consulem audi visse. Now, do you see all those accusatives and infinitives lining up one after the other? And that's because this construction was introduced in the first place by he said, by Dixit, you know, he said, and then everything following it is what he said. Okay? So that would translate as he said that he had come to Rome. He said that his friends were happy and that his enemies had all left the city. The citizens had come together in the forum and had listened to the consul. Okay, all of that is what he said. Okay, right. Now then, that sets you up for what we're going to do next time, which is we're going to leap into some unadulterated Caesar. And I don't want to kind of spook you, but... That's pretty much all we're going to teach you about the Latin language. Um, you know, before we start just reading it. Um, so, chapter 10, if you're wondering, 
is going to uh, introduce Latin poetry and how scansion of Latin poetry works. But apart from that, all the language elements that you need, you've tackled in this course. Um, and there is, you know, apart from vocabulary, obviously you have to keep looking words up. But in terms of the constructions that you will come across, there really isn't anything that hasn't been covered that uh, would cause you any trouble. Okay, so you can give yourself the most enormous pat on the back um, and we'll see how we get on next time when we put it all into practice. Okay, so if in doubt, go back, check everything and see you on this channel very soon.